Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this journey of unbecoming. Through this series of interviews and live trainings, you will be guided to shed who you are not, which will create space in your life for your true self to emerge. It's time to uncover your gift and live life on purpose unapologetically. I am Pete Stedman, your host and guide for this event, and it gives me great pleasure to connect with Kada Brown for this interview. Kada, sorry, Kada. Kada is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature immersion ceremonial encampments around the world. He is an internationally known ceremonialist, healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, Kada has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge of er experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom, teachings, and healing methods from around the world. In 1994, Kader apprenticed with Stephen Foster and Meredith Little at School of Lost Borders in the Sierra Nevada mountains. In the form and process of vision quest ceremony and eco-psychology, he has also apprenticed for many years with Maladoma Som, initiated elder and shaman of the Dagara tribe in Burkina Faso, West Africa. Kader has also had the honor and privilege to learn many valuable insights into healing from his apprenticeship with Cherokee elder and medicine person, William Rocking Bear. Thank you, Kada, for embarking on this journey with us. Thank you, Pete, it's exciting to be here. So the topic of our talk today is ancestral bone memory, reawakening your personal mythos. So before we dive into this, I would love if you would share a little bit of your journey, like how did you get to be where you are now? Well, it's, you know, the hindsight is always the ticket. Looking backwards, I can see a, a choreography that somehow unfolded unbeknownst to me at the time. Um, the title, uh, Ancestral Bone Memory, speaks to some of that unfolding um, in terms of how I got here. And, and here is just, you know, not there and not where I'm going, but it's in this now moment where I am. And... Um, I would definitely say there are ancestral threads of uh, blessing and challenge that uh, were present uh, before I was born. That when I, you know, the, in an in indigenous way of thinking, um, you you're born into four lines of lineage, and those four lines of lineage carry certain blessings and certain medicine and certain challenges or unresolved traumas that we come into. And so <clears throat> some of those for me was around death, which is interesting. I found the way to, to adapt to that by uh, being drawn toward a death and rebirth ceremony as my life's work. Um, but my namesakes, Cater and Stevenson, were both uncles of mine, my dad's brothers that died before I was born. Um, one in a car rack around 19, and one in a house fire when he was around 34. Um, so when I was born, I was given these two names and consequently almost died at birth. And then at two and a half years old, I myself was in a car accident like my namesake, uh, Steve, and um, he died of a head injury in a car accident. And I almost died, I was thrown out of the car, had a head injury and was in a coma for three weeks. Um, so it's in a way I can looking back, I can see I was carrying some unresolved traumas and, and uh, turmoils from the ancestral lineage that needed healing or, or they became certain gatekeepers for me to get through in order to for me to even have uh, being able to move into the life that I came here to live. Um, so that was some of the ancestral uh, challenges that came in with that. Some of the blessings of the ancestral lines that I've discovered through working directly with ancestors, which we'll talk about later, um, and some of the information I've been able to get, gather in middle world kind of way, is, um, you know, this relationship with, to be in relationship with death is to be in relationship with life. Um, as many spiritual traditions say, you know, keep death just over your left shoulder 
throughout your life to remind you how to live uh, and love fiercely, how to live in love with a focused attention on what's important and how to treat every moment as a blessing, as, a, as some important ingredient uh, to the remainder of your life. And so I found in this, this apprenticeship with death that I had at a very early age and then learned to think about it in a certain way has um, really uh, apprenticed me as a way of being excited about life. And, um, and that each of us come here um, carrying a certain spark of genius or what I call medicine or blessing or gift that's uh, in part uh, transmitted to us through the bloodlines of lineage in which we are born through. And then also our own particular soul's uh, way of arcing, like a, a light going through a, a crystal prism, it tends to arc in a certain way that is unique to that that individual. And so, um, and so in my life, I've, in looking back now, I'm almost 64, I can look back and see this, this choreography, uh, particularly through the dark times. Um, while this sounds, you know, quite uh, exciting and unfolding and, and a lot of awareness, um, also have this belief that great journeys or the great journeys of your life and my life very often begin in darkness. Um, the same way that uh, time used to be measured by dark and by night, night by day. And that the beginning of things in the old uh, First Nation people's way of seeing time, that things didn't begin with the light, they actually began you know, with the dark. What we call, what we celebrate in this country is Halloween, which is Samhain or Day of the Dead is this entrance into the dark where things are seated. Um, like we're coming up on that time at the end of October in, in a cyclic period of, of the year um, where we enter the dark. And so in our psyches and our own unfolding, um, or as, as you've put in this particular summit, our unbecoming <laughs> is uh, entered into when we enter these dark times. So one of those particular dark times that was crucial to me navigating here was uh, adolescence. <laughs> um, and uh, in that period, I, I used to love to be in nature and uh, always still love to be in nature, but during that time, um, and I wanted to do what I conceptually thought of uh, as a a rite of passage or a vision quest ceremony, or I didn't have the words for it and nobody in my world knew what that was. Um, and so, but it really rose up when I was around 14 or 15. It even had a conceptual idea of what that would look like for me. But um, I say that went underground and it didn't really rise up until things got, things got much darker in my world. So my father died and, um, and I was, somehow in that in the loss of of that connection to my father um uh, felt like i was really set adrift um and what rose up in me was the 14 year old that said that oh yeah i really wanted to have this kind of experience when i was younger and now he died when i was 32 and by this time i was already a practicing therapist even involving somewhat nature and some of my uh, work with clients um but at his death, what happened is, is that I received, the way I frame it in my mind, I received the blessing from him in his passage where he said, in a way, remember this. And he came to me in a dream not long after his death. And we're in this library and he hands me this book and it says Vision Quest. Uh, uh, and I remind people, at least I tell people at the stage, my dad, my dad sold Mack trucks. So Vision Quest was not kind of a thing that was in his world, <laughs> but there was. And when he was coming to me as an ancestor spirit, you know, he hands me this book. Um, and after seeing it in the dream, I found it. And, uh, and then it set me into a course of uh, beginning to seek that ceremony. Um, and I would also say, this is the stage of unbecoming. So the, the unbecoming started 
uh, maybe even a few years before his death with some uh, challenges in relationship that I was in. And then with his death, it was compounded. So these dark periods where things were begin, the, the unbecoming was happening. And then the uh, seeing the, the book in the dream and then other things that started to happen. Um, Joanna Macy, actually before Joanna Macy, uh, Carl Gustav Jung had this phrase. He said, there's a, a great question uh, that runs like a thread through everyone's life. And if you can find it, um, you can consider yourself very fortunate to follow that question so that your life becomes a response to that question that you carry. Um, and so I felt like I found it or he passed it on to me at his death. And I had the experience of walking down, coming out of a, a, a daycare where I just dropped off my my daughter, who was two at the time, and walking out of this daycare onto this rural country road out in the uh, in the county of the the place I lived. And I looked up, and coming down the road in front of me were three covered wagons, and literally they were there. This is not hallucination. Um, cut, drawn by horses <laughs> and on the side of these wagons in lettering that must have been six feet tall it said vision quest and I saw that and I just started to weep like something was something other than me was calling me forward into this ceremony into this way of being um, that seemed separate from my own challenges um and I remember going home that night and I had these sacred path cards that maybe some people have heard of. And I laid them out on the ground. There's 42 of them. And I laid them out face down and I drew one and it was the vision quest card. And I shuffled them and drew another one and it was the vision quest card. And I shuffled them and drew another one. And each time, three times in a row, I drew them the same card out of 42. Um, and then... Uh, the experience after that was I was in a, um, uh, my friend invited us, my family and I to a church and I went and I was sitting in the pew thinking about this, this ceremony and being up on the mountain and dealing with all your fears because that's what comes up when you're unbecoming, right? It's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a fun experience, <laughs> although it is very powerful. That's the distinction. Um and I was imagining being up on the mountain and I reflected on my own entrance into ritual and ceremony through Irish Catholic Catholicism, which is my ancestral background. And I thought about the cross as a, it used to be a four equal sided symbol before it became Christianized and it was a medicine wheel and it was a cosmology system, the symbol itself. And I thought, you know, as a way of honoring my own childhood and entrance into a, a certain pathway of the sacred, while it doesn't fit for me anymore, I'm going to take that small cross and carry it in my medicine bag. And no matter what fears that I have to deal with when I'm out there on the mountain, I'm just going to, I'll just deal with them. And the service ended and there was a tap on my shoulder. Now, I've never been in this church before and I only went that one time and I turned around and there were two old people taller than me so they'd be about six three four five somewhere in that range and I look up at them and they both have long gray hair the man and the woman and the man looks at me in my eyes and he said I'm supposed to give you this and he reaches out and puts that little cross in my hand right at that moment and I was like I'm, I'm thinking how is this even happening um part of me even thought I don't even think they're from this world <laughs> I don't know where they came from <laughs> Um, but in that brief encounter where he puts in my hand the very thing that I was just imagining and seeing that I would carry up on the mountain. And then the final thing, I wasn't committed to the ceremony yet. Some people say I'm kind of hard headed that way. Um, but I had, uh, I was working as a therapist. So I, uh, took a break in my, uh, therapy day of seeing clients and I went across the river to work out at this health club. And I'd gotten done and I went down to the locker room, opened the door of the locker and, and something shot out of the locker so fast. I didn't see it when it came. I saw some movement and it hit me about right here. Interesting, it's what, like what we call the soul seat. Um, and it startled me because it had kind of a, a force to it, like a dart. 
And i um, so startled. I looked around to see if somebody had thrown something at me and nobody was there. And I looked down at the floor and there at my feet were four feathers and they were red, yellow, black, and white, which is the, the way we con conceptualize the medicine wheel, at least in this hemisphere and the four colors of the wheel. Um, and so at that moment, uh, not only do I know that somehow I better do this ceremony, um, and I went and talked with a friend of mine who worked with uh, the Sun Bear tribe out in Washington state and uh, told him what I just told you. And he said, I think you better go do this because they're not going to be, they're not going to continue to be nice about this. <laughs> and I realized that things may get more difficult if I didn't respond. Um, so I, I wrote a letter to Stephen and Meredith at the school of both borders said, I want to come, you know, apprentice with you i want to come quest with you and told him the story i just shared with you and he said uh, well we're not taking people out on the mountain anymore because we're getting too old but i will teach you how to do this um so i said great i'll do it and he said come out here next year it was about a year later he said come out here next september and i went and in my apprenticeship when i was on the mountain for my fourth night of the ceremony and that whole time i was out there that four days and four nights I'm sitting there on the mountain up about 10,000 feet in the Sierra Nevadas. And it occurs to me that that night, that night was two years to the exact moment that my father died. And he came to me in a dream and handed me that book. And when I came off the mountain, I knew or I would say, I would say now I remembered that this is what I was here to offer. Um, and, uh, and so I dedicated my life to beginning to bridge those worlds of depth psychology into ritual and ceremony um, until psychology actually began to fade away and there was nothing left but this side. Um, and when I began my work with melodoma and rocking bear and and, and other indigenous folks that gave me a whole different way of conceptualizing reality from a more animus perspective um, and, and how to work with people in that context. And so for the past, uh, yeah, I would say for the past 30, 30 years has been dedicated to that way, 35 years really working with people um, and the past 30 years have, have really kind of directed me more into the, the realm of ceremony and ritual and, and healing in that way. And, um, and for those of you out there hearing this story, while it may sound however it sounds to you, when I said the part about great journeys begin in darkness, to not, to not look at your difficulties and, and tend to pathologize them, uh, as something that needs fixing, but look at them as mythological and something that requires a guide because you're entering in the unbecoming is that this process of what we call in the rites of passage stages. It's what's called the severance phase or the death lodge phase of an initiatory passage. That's the unbecoming part is uh, where we're we're moving through the severance phase and, and, and in the context of the severance phase, there's also this process called death lodge work. And it's really the breaking down of old beliefs, old ways of being, old ways of knowing, old ways of loving um, that have served us in many ways. Um, and it brings us up to the, the precipice of the threshold phase. And I want to, delineate this this unbecoming process because the un, unbecoming can be quite disruptive maybe you're going through a divorce maybe you lost your job um maybe there's been a death like what activated mine um like something uh disrupts your your world to such a degree that you feel untethered um and in that process of becoming untethered things start falling away or sometimes we let them go intentionally. Um, but there is a process of letting go that is uh, 
cannot be choreographed by one's own intent. It's more like being broken open by life and those experiences. So it, it humbles us and, and it brings us uh, literally to our knees to, to reach out to something other than our own resourcefulness uh, or e even something greater than whatever we can find in this middle world reality of support. Um, and so the unbecoming is uh, the way I think about it is this breaking down process of um, getting us uh, ready uh, for the words, I don't know what to do. And I say that, I mean, you can hear the grief in my voice because I remember those moments in my life when people, when, when people come to me in that state and they say, they're in tears, they say, I don't know what to do. I think you're there. This is the place. Uh, this is what a uh, creator has been waiting for you to get to uh, because it's here that not the becoming starts, but we enter the threshold. And I say that from the severance, from the unbecoming into the threshold phase, uh, the threshold phase is the territory, not only of the unknown, but the unknowable. It, it has ingredients of both. And it's through that passage, through the severance and the threshold um, that often requires uh, a, a, a person in the form of a navigational guide, instrument in a way, to help us navigate the territory of the unknown and the unknowable. Um, and it's also in that place of following the, the un, unbecoming after entering the threshold phase that we begin to remember. I heard once in Africa, they say all learning is simply remembering. True learning is remembering. And so following this unbecoming, the seeds and the awakening of uh, memories that hold the um, the blueprints of who we came here to be and, and what medicine or blessings we came here to offer. Um, and sometimes that unbecoming and that process requires some reconciliation work with ancestors because, you know, they uh, just because they're dead doesn't mean we like them <laughs> um, or that they're even likable now. Um, and so sometimes there's some ancestral clearing work that has to be done to, to even restore the flow of blessing and medicine that moves through everyone's lineage um, to be able to access those memories even more clearly. Um, and there are certain relationships with um, ancestral helping spirits, as they're often called, or allies, um, so that this this offering that begins to be seated in the dark time or in the unbecoming is not something that's simply of our own personality and our own intellect. It's something that comes through us and is certainly arced or, or charged or uh, accentuated in a particular way by our, our intellect and our interests and our gifts, um, but it's not, of, it's not from us. Um, and this is a very important part because it's, it's one that requires relationship, um, with a greater community, not only of living, uh, but also of non-living. And so we begin to see that what, what is moving through me and, and he's, even what carried me through those dark nights when it felt utterly alone, as I'm sure many of you can relate to that something carries you through that time um, that is other than yourself. Um, and it is this, this uh, awareness and this relationship um, that begins to, to move through a person um, that I, I found that, you know, the most, you know, fascinating, awe-inspiring, and um, reassuring, certainly in the, the darker times of unbecoming. So that's, um, without going into much detail about the unbecoming uh, moments, which uh, <laughs> flashing in front of my eyes, usually they, they involve some feeling of, I don't know what to do, despair, literal dark night, often on my knees, um, 
and pray into anything from a small tree to a yellow warbler. I mean, different visions of, of that, that place uh, when you get to, I don't know what to do. Um, and you, and you're, you're broken open. It's like at that moment, you become available to grace. Um, until that moment, grace doesn't have an, a way in. Um, but once you get to that moment of, I don't know what to do, then grace says, has its own pathway in, um, and uh, and we can talk more about what the unbecoming is from, um, because we all, most of us in, in modernity, grow up in a in societies where the the maps of that were given as to who we are to be are decided on by the values of the society we live in. And I remember Joseph Campbell once said, you know, if you ever want to know the, the values and the mythologies of your particular society, take a look around and see what the tallest buildings are. And that will tell you the current mythology that your society operates by. And, um, and so we're often given maps that are in service to the mythologies of our society. Um, for some of us, those fit. For many of us, um, there's such a misalignment with this other map that we're born with. Um, and I, in, in one of my uh, poems, I have this, this stanza that says, if, if you are not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living in existence that is not entirely your own. <clears throat> and, that, and that life is the one that's waiting just a few paces in front of you looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide, waiting for you to remember. And as David uh, White would say, apprentice yourself to yourself. Walk to the horizons of your own dreams. Stand at the edge of that place. Um, the, the edge of uncertainty is where our creativity becomes most alive. It's, it's like a, a razor's edge of uncertainty. When we arrive there, it's like something activates our own creativity that doesn't happen when we're not there. And, and that unbecoming that you speak of brings us to that edge of uncertainty where creativity is activated and also relationship with other sources of wisdom, compassion, love and support and guidance. Uh, grace, if we just call it that, becomes available. So... Um, Thank you for the opportunity to go into a rabbit hole. I'm, my students always accuse me of, of going down rabbit holes and sometimes they encourage me, but I, I can get, I could talk for hours down in those rabbit holes. So I want to climb out <laughs> and check back in with you. I know so, I was loving that. I was, I was so grateful for you sharing your personal journey and sharing these, the insights and the, it's kind of the opportunities for people, the people listening to this. It's like, okay, so, in this, this is what I'm going through. This is what, but it's the, one of the, the things you were referring to or talking to was this like a seed being planted and going into the darkness. And it's like a seed has to go into the darkness to plant. Mm, yeah. Let's ignore hydroponics, but in, the, in, in essence of how a seed functions in nature, it's like they, they go in the darkness. And they're, it's, they're it's from yeah. that they, they break open but they're not broken. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there's a distinct difference in that. Um, and so I, I've just been, I'm like taking notes of my own. I'm like, this is, this is so uh, inspiring how you're putting this, how you're, and for me, it's very, there's very similar threads or patterns in this, in how we can't, the, our, our life path, when we're on the right path, it flows. The signs emerge. It's like, it was very clear for you. And, and I'm sure other people can see it in their lives. It's like, I keep seeing this thing, but based on the society around me or culture, it's not the right, there's an uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's where a lot of people are at now. It's like, how, how do I know I'm going in the right way? Or how do I, like, how do I know, like that sort of navigating out of the confusion and I would love it if you would introduce how like the ancestral bone memory can work to, to guide people in that space. 
Well, the 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 unbecoming process and the dark night that we all encounter at some point or many points um, is an invitation to reconciliation. That whatever we we say in from a ceremonial ritual context, whatever challenges you're going through uh, didn't begin with you, and the roots of those uh, challenges are are often in your lineage in different forms. And, and so um, one way of looking at it, the way I look at it is you, you, you come in for different reasons to, to receive the blessings and the medicine of, of the certain lineage lines that you're connected to, but also you carry a certain responsibility, as they say, to do one better than was done before. And that is to reconcile uh, these places um, that have occurred in the lineage um, that have left residue of uh, trauma or fear or uncertainty. Um, like those, those still exist in the line. They still exist in your bone memory and your DNA memory. Um, and so we encounter those, those places um, and that thought that, yeah, when we're on the right path, it seems to flow. Well, not at first. Um, at first, there's this uh, reconciling between uh, the life you came here to live and the one you've been living and the, the disproportionate degree of separation between those two is the discomfort. Um, and so the, this realignment process of uh, bringing those two together, as I spoke of earlier, the, the, um, the myths of your society, the mythologies of your society and what society asks of you uh, may have little to nothing to do with who you came here to be. Um, and finding a way to show up uh, so that your passion, I say where your passion intersects with the needs of your people is where you find the most healing and you have the most healing to offer. And, and, um, and so part of that work is, um, you know, soul work, ancestral work, healing work. Um, this, this idea of the, the spiritual bypass um, is, uh, is uh, illusionary, that you just find this, this way of connecting with spirit and all is well. And, um, and uh, we like to say in, in, a, in initiatory circles, um, initiations and, and and rites of passage of those shifting of consciousness have two elemental trajectories. Uh, one is of fire and one is of water. And an elemental initiatory experience by fire is when somebody comes so impassioned on fire, we say, with vision, with purpose, with direction, and, and it's like they can't not follow it. Um, and, and some... Uh, places in Africa, they would say you, there's a genie possession, like your genie, your genius uh, has, has uh, taken over. <laughs> um, and the beautiful thing is, yeah, it is the right path. However, if you don't have a, uh, uh, an elder, somebody to help you navigate that kind of energy, it can kill you. Um, and I've known stories where that's happened with people where they're just so on fire um, it, it, it becomes dangerous, even though it's, it's something good. Now, the other trajectory is one of water. And this is more than what we call the initiatory descent. Um, this is uh, uh, whenever water appears in a story, a, a, a mythological story like fire, whenever fire appears, it, it speaks of a kind of uh, initiation by spirit. Whenever water appears in a story, it means we're going on a descent. There's down, there's dark water, you're going under. And this is a, a place of reconcil of ancestral reconciliation, of, of memory and emotion and, and uh, repressed feelings and, and stories of things that need reconciling. Um, and the unbecoming process often brings us to those places. It's like it's necessary. We can't we can't become the new until we've healed healed the old, 
And so this, these uh, trajectories of descent into water, under earth, earth and water, uh, similar to air and fire, earth and water is a downward arc, um, requires us to do that deeper work, that soul work, that healing work. Um, you know, in, in this day and age where um, there's a lot of sensitivity to uh, the traumas that have been um, perpetuated onto First Nations peoples, and it's horrendous. But I would say to those that carry some of, at least some of the bloodline connections to being the perpetrator, like in my world and, and in you know my ancestry, that happens because we have we have kind of blown through our own traumas and therefore perpetuated them onto others across generations. So it's our own ability to, to pull back and say, wait a minute, what about the healing that needs to happen here? Um, and so these unbecoming processes is a way of inviting us uh, into dialogue, into circles, into connections with mentors that have walked, you know, I'd say at least 15 years ahead of you down these roads um, that you can connect with. Um, that knows something about the territory you're walking through, somebody who's not going to pathologize your your uh, what looks like uh, unbecom the unbecoming process, <laughs> um, but help to mythologize it to give it a, a a certain like no you're you're just you're you're unbecoming in just the right way, <laughs> and it looks messy at times and painful at times and exciting at times. Um, and so that's uh, that's why I speak of in a, in a rite of passage, we talk about the calling, the severance, the threshold, the return, and then the incorporation or the giveaway. And this unbecoming that occurs in the beginning, that maybe there is a calling, like I had a calling. And as I responded to the call, that's where the severance started, like the self-doubt, and, and like things started, like the severance is now happening. Um and the breakdown and the letting go and the shifting starts to happen. But the, uh, and callings don't always look so uh, nicely packaged as the way I presented. Um, as you remember, my calling began with death and the relationship turmoil. And um, that was actually the beginning, <laughs> the seeding, the dark time. Um, so yeah, those are some thoughts on that relationship to ancestors. And you know, in, in in modernity, especially in the West, I'll speak of us here because it's more I can I live here and can talk about that. There's a sense that uh, of disconnection um, to to ancestral um, blessing because if we, especially if we had um, you know connection to relationship with certain dead that are that were not. You know, we'd say, frankly, they were assholes when they were here. Why would I even want to consider them now to be of any help? <laughs> um, it's more like, well, there are some that existed before the time of that turmoil, before the traumas. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, that gets a lot into also understanding the difference between being dead and being an ancestor, which in indigenous cultures, those aren't the same thing where we lump those things together. Um, it's like, no, there's a whole different realm of, of connecting with ancestral allies that's different than somebody who has simply just died and died in a state of unwellness and turmoil. And, and then their turmoil becomes our turmoil. Um, and so there, there are ways of, uh, through ritual and ceremony to actually uh, connect with and call on the the what we call the bright and shiny ones, the well ancestors, to assist us in healing the places and the lineage that are that are troubled. Um, and so that's that's another part of the the reframing and the working of those things. But um, but I assure you, those dark times that you encounter in your life uh, didn't begin with you. Um, and the fact that you're encountering them also means that you carry some of the antidote for healing them. Otherwise, they wouldn't be showing up. Um, and that's another, when I say that, you know, hopefully we do one better than was done before, um, that when you're encountering trouble, it means that uh, 
there's some antidote of healing response you carry in response to that trouble um, and finding ways to address it um, by bringing your your best self forward your 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 own personal mythology your own initiated self forward because um, often when you I say when you focus when you simply focus on trouble you just get more trouble but if you focus on the delivery of your gift your genius your medicine you often don't show up on the radar of the trouble because your your attention is in a different way and that isn't to avoid what i call the spiritual bypass to avoid dealing with uh the healing that's necessary um that's not what I'm talking about, but I'm saying, uh, in and as you reconcile and as you do that healing work, your your navigational instrument becomes very clear as what to focus on, and that is, uh, you focus on where you're, where you want to go, not where you've been. Um, as I say, focus on the delivery of your gift, not on the trouble, um, so that you at least you know where you're headed. Um, and not get stuck in trouble, or at least bad trouble. I say that that uh, <laughs> there's only two kinds of life. One is one is bad trouble, and one is good trouble. If you're living the life you came here to live, it, it looks like good trouble, but it's the kind of trouble that's that's good to be in. <laughs> I want to. I want to. Like your the way you uh, um, you share your message is so empowering, and I. Like there's so much wisdom which you hold here, and I'm like the I'm grateful for the work that you're doing for your clients, and to, just to guide people on their journey of their own self discovery and realizing and uncovering their gift and how to embody and share that with the world. Um, and there was parts in what you were saying where, like, one which really stood out for me was that it was the guide and the mentor part. It's like it's it's so important to have that person in your life to to anchor you so you don't just like take off when you all of a sudden like that's one of the risks about the unbecoming process is you're becoming vulnerable you're shedding the things you don't you don't don't serve you but if you don't have that mentor or the guide in your life to help you go in the right direction you can just you're, you're prone to attack or you're prone to uh be drifting in the wrong direction possibly further off course yeah, it's it's as I say the when you're in that it can actually become dangerous if you don't have uh, the right kind of navigational assistance, um, and sometimes um, the tendency to misinterpret what's going on with you or to misinterpret that it's that you're stuck that there is no way out. Um, how do people how do people connect with that? How do people sort of because I want to make sure that people are getting, it's like, okay, we, we've highlighted some of the things which, some of the amazing things which can happen, some of the things which can, some of the things to be aware of. I love the part around just being on fire or the descent and just that the way you're, you're sharing the journey of unbecoming is literally that. It's, it's your, you're creating space. You're just, you're so that, but you need to create the space because everybody's day is so full. That they've got to start saying no to something or releasing things or um, to set their sort of re reignite the fire inside of them. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But what are the sorts of things which people, how do people embody this? How, do pe how can people ensure that they're going in the right direction or at least starting in the right direction? So there's there's something of an excerpt from a, a book that Wendell Berry wrote called The Unsettling of America. And in that, he pulled a, an excerpt out that, that read something like this. I received a letter, uh, a, a suicide letter from a recent, uh, from a friend. Um, and my friends uh, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And they had said that they were in one of these dark nights and they couldn't find the way out um, and didn't know what to do. They were in one of those soul descents, as I say, and, and it can get quite um, sometimes anxious and depressing. And the letter had already asked the question, how does one get from one stage of life to another without completely 
uh, breaking down to the point of, of this kind of situation. And it also answered with help from tradition and the ancient ceremonies and rituals and rites of passage work that were designed to be uh, uh, offered at these stages. Like this, when, when we look back, uh, even if you look into your own ancestral lineage, if you go far enough back, you will find that in these uh, particular predictable developmental passages of breakdown, um, that there were uh, initiatory rituals, rites of passage ceremonies, things designed to, to ritualize or put into a ceremonial context these experiences. Um, that's why I say they're not pathologized or they're more like ritualized. Um, and the modern day version of that is to find, uh, uh, I call them ceremonial midwives or, or rites of passage guys, people that help usher people across that that unbecoming and threshold phase of, of not knowing um, that the people's life's work has become that. Um, some of the things you offer, some things I offer, and probably many people on this, this summit offer. Um, and also have enough uh, wisdom that some of the traditional places that uh, modernity says, this is where you go. Um, because they carry a certain license or carry, I mean, those things are helpful, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they themselves know this territory or have uh, found ways to navigate it. Sometimes the places we go to for support are simply just more clever at hiding their own <laughs> trouble <laughs> than we are, <laughs> so they don't appear to have it. Um, and uh, so finding, uh, finding a, a trusted guide, be it in one of those fields, helping fields, or, you know, someone that just does uh, uh, this kind of unbecoming work, to use your term, the, the, to assist people in that process of, of navigating that territory. Um, there are many places, many people that do that kind of work. Um, so just know that, they're, that they're out there. Um, and um, this summit, if you're if you're on this summit and you're hearing all of this, then you've got a wealth of resources of, of speakers and people and even connecting with Pete here um, that can direct you um, so that you at least you have this and you, you can say, well, ask this person or would you email this person and they can direct you in a certain way. Um, so I think that's essential of kind of knowing who to ask and, and where to go. Um, and, you know, these, these kind of challenges and dark nights of the soul, as we call them, and, and unbecoming processes, they're not new. Um, and there are, there are ancient and time-tested ways of, of holding them within a certain container um, that enables them and enables you in them to, to resource uh, the the gold that lives inside of them um, as opposed to something that's simply just designed to make you not feel it so that you can go on uh, maintaining a life that you're really not comfortable with anyway and so that's one of those differentiating is 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 my res my question I would ask myself is is the res is the assistance I have found um in helping me navigate this territory is it simply just designed to help me become emotionally comfortable with a life that somehow i don't really want to be living in this way um that's not an answer um that's going to require a repression of your own sensitivities and empathic awareness and feelings or does it provide a kind of container and a, and a type of guide that can assist me in, in uh, seeing it more naturopathically, like something's happening here that's important. Because say, when you get to the place of being able to clearly say, I don't know what to do, now you're ready. Um, and now we begin. Um, and so having a, 
like you don't need fixing. That would be my saying. And if you're going to somebody that's trying to fix you, then run and find somebody that uh, is not interested in seeing you as broken, um, but can assist you in navigating these deep currents and these deep waters. Um, and I want to say this, you know, in, in service to uh, mental health traditions, it doesn't even mean that necessarily that certain um, assistance from certain forms of medication isn't part of that journey. So I'm not telling anybody like to avoid that kind of help. I, I believe in that and many times that can be helpful to help at certain moments. Um, it is more in the, the guide that you're working with and how if they're able to help you see this um, as uh, something to navigate and embrace and, and draw and resource more of yourself from rather than simply to fix or um, make you not feel it. it and, um, you know, grief is painful. Um, and yet without it, there's no joy. Um, and there's this razor's edge. I'd say there's a razor's edge between grief and gratitude um, that uh, we can only get through by going through, allowing the grief, allowing the water um, to, to help us reach the place of, of gratitude and openness. Um, and yeah, I think certain kinds of guides that uh, aren't troubled by your degree of trouble. <laughs> that will tell you that they've actually done your own work. That's a good question to ask is that, uh, have you navigated these waters? Have you done this kind of work that you're suggesting I do? Um, so it's not something they studied in school or saw on a video or read in a book. It's like, you know, they're, they're just looking at a version of themselves um, and they, they know something about this territory. Um, and so there's some help in that. Um, and having many people, I would say definitely, I would say have some elders in your life, people that are 10, 15 years older, that are traveling a similar course of uh, even interest in how they seem to have arrived there, or at least wherever they are. Um, uh, having those kind of resources and support um, around you so you're not feeling alone in it. I think isolation and aloneness are the most deadly things. Um, and and uh, I assure you, whatever you're going through, uh, you are not alone in it. And there, there are uh, time-tested ancient ways that we know of how to navigate these passages. Um, and when people have come to me in those really dark places and even spoke of, you know, sometimes I think about suicide and I say, well, I do hear that something is trying to die, but don't misinterpret this. This isn't you, but it may be an old way of loving that has you've outgrown, that you may be adapted early in your life as a way of connecting and loving from this place. And it doesn't, it doesn't serve you anymore. It doesn't work anymore. And to try and hold on to the old ways of loving and being and, um, won't carry you forward, won't carry you across this threshold. Um, and, uh, and you're remembering more and more through this dismantling process, this unbecoming, you're remembering in the darkness, you're remembering who you are and who you came here to be. And, and as I like to remind people, there are certain gifts and medicine and blessings that you carry that if you don't bring them to your community, no one else will. It's it's uh, it's different than this this think of, of scarcity and and better than less than thinking. Um, all right, which our our society is built on scarcity and better less than thinking, where you can be better and or you can be less. Um, and the truth is, you can't be better and you can't be less. You can be you or you can not be you. And, and scarcity is an illusion of living out that's perpetuated by living out of balance, uh, one with the, the natural world around you and with your core self. Um, so it puts us in a, a state of anxious uh, scarcity perception. Um, 
So those are those are things I think to to look for in, in, in a guide. Thank you for sharing that. I um, like a big part of this. There was a really interesting use, thing you were saying about the um, like almost like suicidal tendency or that depression or something. And it's like it's it's not that you need to die. It's a part of you. It's the which is essentially it is part of the process. It's and shedding those identities which we've fought so hard to create are hard. Yeah. But it's but it's necessary for us to navigate those waters to be able to do what we're here to do. And I, I also like the, the other part you were saying is like the further you are drifting off course, the the bigger that level of discomfort is. Right. And so for me, it's an it's an inherent cost of inaction. Like if people know they're on a path they don't they don't belong on, but continue to go there, it's like for how long right. how long are you right. willing to play this game it's like it's you're you're robbing yourself and you're robbing the world of your gift yeah it's yeah it's it's you know i often see that as i tell people when they come to things that we offer and and um especially the the deeper immersion like the 12 days with the four day four night solo wilderness fast and all that and their their focus is on that four days and nights or if you're doing a walkabout, I think you mentioned in some of the stuff you are, there's a, there's a walkabout that lasts so long and they tend to focus on, oh, I don't know, like, can I do this? And I reassure them, that's the easiest part. For getting here, like having the awareness to get yourself to the threshold of doing this, that's, that's hard. And then the return. Uh, and the reason the return can often be hard is that you're returning to an old way of being that you may not fit into uh, anymore. And so that becomes a, a reconciling. I've had people come to things that we've done and they go back into the world they left before they came here and they feel this like, I don't even, it's like trying to put on a pair of shoes that you don't, they don't fit anymore. And you're trying to force them in there. And it's like, this is really uncomfortable. Like it was a little bit uncomfortable when I left and now it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> and and so that's it's a way of like, okay, how do I make my life more like what I experienced over here? And that takes time. It's not like a snap to thing. Um, be patient with yourself. If you go through these experiences, like the one you spoke of, of the walkabout or things that I'm speaking of or other speakers, it's not like you come back fixed. Uh, I think you come back from those experience more in touch with your original blueprint of uh, of your authentic nature and, and how you are. Um, and if you've been living a disproportionate life from that, when you return to that, it's going to feel like, oh, and I've had people not be able to sleep in their house for three weeks because we, you know, we do a lot of outdoor stuff because it was just, they didn't know how to, to do that. And so that's when, um, the, the work also becomes it's like the return is not now that you're better it's more like now that you're you've returned from this experience how do you make your life more like that experience um one of my teachers uh, will rocking bear says he says you as you get older you want to live your life as a ceremony and what that means is live with that kind of understanding that when you're living your life as a ceremony, you live it in that kind of awareness. Like be intentional with your actions. Uh, be, be deliberate. Um, and the more and more awareness you can bring to, uh, to your life around you, the more conscious intention you can respond to life with. Um, and... Uh, his favorite teaching was, he said, the three most important things are pay attention. <laughs> and that's, uh, yeah. Um, we're just, we're drawing to a close here on the interview. And I, I know you have a gift to share. Um, you have a, a recording telling the story of Singing Stone. Would you like to share a little of that? Sure. Um, a little bit about the gift. Also, um, one of the things I'm in my own life, I'm moving more and more towards working with the guides, um, doing more teaching and, and um, 
so the things I'm offering personally, if you go to the website, uh, are things that are more about uh, teaching people about becoming ceremonial midwives, as I like to call them. The gift itself is um, a, a rhythmical drumming story that myself and my djembe drum tell um, that's called Singing Stone. It was gifted to me many, many years, at least the bare bones in the, uh, of the story were gifted to me about 30 years ago uh, by Stephen and Meredith, and it was gifted to them. And, and as storytellers tend to do, I've, I've filled out those particular bones with many other details. And so the story has grown, but it's a story of the initiatory journey of unbecoming to remember who you are. That would be the most concise way. It's a, uh, I think of the initiatory journey is that it, that's a journey of unbecoming. And, and uh, at the end of that, there should be more memory uh, and awareness about who you are once that has happened. So it's uh, uh, a story of the initiatory journey of unbecoming and remembering. That's incredibly kind of you. I, would, I encourage everybody listening and watching this to please go and check that out. And, and let Kaden know what it's how, what came up for you, how this felt. Just share your experience with Kaden. So what's the best way for people to connect with you? Um, by email, um, just go or going to the website. You can, um, if, you, if you want to have a conversation with me, particularly about any of the offerings, there's a way to schedule a, a free 20 minute chat. And I'd be glad to talk with you about any of the, the initiatory experiences that we offer. Um, or if you just want to email, um we can we can interact that way as well those are those are the best ways so base one of the things which I, I didn't get to talking about in our interview was just about it's it's reconnection it's like how can everybody here have, find a way to reconnect to themselves reconnect to nature reconnect to each other because I, there's so much disconnection in the world so i i want to i want to invite you to to participate in this participate in the receive the free gift and do recognize that you you are not broken you're it's this is a, a portal for you to be somebody di completely different you could be the same person you you could just align with the path you belong on yeah i like that that word unbecoming reminds me of how people often take the word remembering and and separate it and put re and then membering which is a connecting um, and un and then becoming it's a, it's, uh, it's a way of looking at connecting first with self and, and then with other and then the bigness of the other not just human other but other than human other um, so yes I, I love that analogy um, uh, just as we're drawing to a close is there anything else you would like to share with our audience here just to just to empower them on their journey um Remember that you're not alone. And there are many, many, many others, uh, both that have traveled this, this territory that you are in, some a few years ahead of you, some maybe even a few years behind you that you could turn around and offer something to. Um, and finding that, that particular village or connection or community through, through others. Um, also say where you can spend some time in nature without an agenda. Just take your journal and go sit. And I say, if you, if you want to make a place sacred, sit there long enough and notice the details of everything that happens around you. And, and it will become sacred because you gave it your attention. And the ones that live in that place give you their attention. You may be surprised if a bird lands on your knee or a squirrel runs across your lap <laughs> um, once you have that kind of connection. Um, so it's just a, a couple of a couple of little ritual prescriptions. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Kater. It's been wonderful to, uh, connecting with you once again. Thank you, Pete. <clears throat> I really appreciate being here. It's been great.